He said, verily I say to you, among them that are born of women, of course, that would be everybody, um, there has not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Now, you're, I think we're all familiar with the text, but if somebody were to ask you to quote it, you, may, you might say, I think it's said that there has not risen a greater prophet than John the Baptist. So, and that is in the scripture. So let's look at both of them. And there's just two of them. In the Matthew account, which, which we just looked at, there's not risen a greater than John the Baptist. But in the other, which is in Luke 7, 28, it's a little bit different. It says, for I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there has not, ridden, not risen a greater prophet than John the Baptist. So it seems like our Lord, while it's a wonderful tribute, is um, limiting it to prophets. The problem or the reality here is that the word prophet is spurious in the Luke text. It just doesn't belong there. And if you go to, I think, just about any translation other than King James, you just won't find it. So we have to drop it out. And then the, the only two accounts where this is quoted, Matthew 11 and Luke 7, are the same. And it is a wonderful, wonderful tribute to him. This is when Jesus had departed after learning of the death of the Baptist, and he went off by himself, which we'll try to, to uh, get to before we finish. So a question might arise, does that mean that, is Jesus saying that John was the greatest person that has ever lived? Was he saying that? Well, let's look at a no answer and, and, a, and a, a yes answer. So we'll just ask that question again. Did Jesus uh, say that John the Baptist was the greatest person who had ever lived? Well, let's go again with the no proposition first. Um, it does say there was none, without trying to fine tune this too much, it does say that there was none greater. It might mean that there were some that were equal to John, that were just as great. So that that's a possibility, not something we want to spend days and days thinking about, but it's a possibility. Let's look at the yes proposition that Jesus was saying that he was the greatest that had ever lived. Well, if that's what he was saying, there was not only no one greater, but he was the greatest, which is quite quite a statement. Uh, perhaps it would have been, if that's correct, that Jesus personally introduced the Messiah. You know, there were several prophets that prophesied that he is coming, the Messiah is coming. John's role would to say, was to say and did say that the Messiah is here. We all know the text, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So for that reason, yes, might apply. He personally introduced the Messiah in incredibly meaningful and responsible uh, aspect of John's life, really the whole aspect. And I, I know that uh, this could take some more discussion, but since we're all familiar with John the Baptist, I think we can all recognize that he had a... Uh, remarkable selfless determination to do God's will. I mean, he was born to a destiny. That was his purpose for living. And he, we're not sure what age, but he went out into the desert, lived as prophets of that time with the camel hair coat and the leather belt and so forth. And he was, his life was absolutely consumed with announcing the coming of our Savior. Just resolute and single-minded, totally committed to that ministry. So for those reasons, maybe Jesus was, Jesus was saying or did say, there was no one greater that had ever lived. Now he is of course accepting himself. He's always an exception. Now, one possible objection to the yes answer was that it we do know that his ministry was very short. It was 
extremely meaningful and very difficult on him. But compared to some other prophets and just other individuals in the scriptures who are examples, prophets or not, his ministry was very short. It wasn't many, many, many years. It was just a few months. And he had a single solitary message. He wasn't prophesying about aspects of the plan of God other than the coming of the Messiah. Well, I don't know if this objection, if anybody would have it, uh, would be a biblical one. And I think we can, uh, by the way, uh, I don't have a list of all the prophets here, and these numbers are not exact. But Jeremiah's ministry was about 40 years. Isaiah's was longer than that. Now, that's a long time. It's like most of their life. <laughs> Ezekiel, 20 years, and so on. Well, apostle objection again that it might be it might have been too short. Well, let's take a quick look, just apart from John for a moment, and look at the deacon Stephen, because he is somebody that we have uh, authority, divine authority, in terms of the inspired scriptures, about concluding uh, how long he was in the way and what his fate was after his death. So we know that Stephen was a deacon in the early church. And uh, let me just get the, um, the texts here. It's in Acts. I think I, might, have, I might, have, might be coming up. I think it's Acts 4 and 5. Anyway, we know that he was falsely accused by, by Jewish leaders. And he was stoned to death as punishment based on the false accusations against him. We know that Paul talked about this, about uh, his Paul's coat and so forth, and felt a, a responsibility, of course, of, of participating in this, even though he didn't throw a stone. There's a whole nother lesson in that. Well, in the, in the passages about Stephen, um, there are some divinely inspired comments. And so we have to take them in, in that regard. His face was like the face of an angel. He was full of God's grace and power. He was, this is probably the most significant in terms of his standing and his calling, in terms of being spirit begotten. He was full of the Holy Spirit. So his ministry began about a year after our Lord's crucifixion roughly. And he was probably, you know, we don't have a lot of specifics on this. He was probably about 35 years old. So he would be what would be called a, a young man, and certainly not long in the narrow way. His ministry was very brief. Well, I think we can conclude from Stephen, even though it's a, it's a very impactful story, it's relatively short, but it's in the word of God for a reason, for a lesson, that it does not have to take very long to prove our faithfulness to the Lord um, and to make one's calling and election sure. It doesn't, it's not necessarily a very long time. When you look at Stephen, it was apparently just a few months. And so that's a lesson that we can take away from that. Now, um, and we can apply that to John the Baptist in terms of the brevity of his ministry and also why he was considered so faithful. Um, you know, some of us are long in the way, been consecrated for many years. Some of the Lord's people, those that have been spirit begotten, and I don't mean somebody who's a Bible student, I mean somebody who's spirit begotten, they could have made their calling and election sure in the first few months or the first couple of years, and they continue to live for a few more decades, maintaining their faithfulness. Others, I assume, take a few decades to prove their faithfulness. So we don't really have an insight into that because we can't read the Lord's mind. But we can't, we do have a, a clear example of somebody that, without question, based on what was said about him under divine inspiration, was faithful unto death, short ministry, but the Lord counted him worthy of that divine nature reward. Okay, so we started out with this, verily I say to you, no one greater. Uh, let's get the other part of that verse here. 
And that's an interesting comment to finish off that verse. Notwithstanding, this is our, our, words, our Lord's words, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So he starts out saying there's been none greater than John the Baptist, and almost as if he's saying, but by the way, he is least, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. Well, how how is that possible? <laughs> Greatest in one area, least in the other. I think it has to do with the reward that was available. I, I think we generally look at John the Baptist as the last individual, last faithful, faithful servant of God, where the reward for faithfulness was not only an awakening from the dead, but a resurrection from the dead, like the ancient worthies. Uh, and no one greater than him in that, in that regard. Um, notice that it says, well, let, let's just go to Hebrews for, uh, to get the gist of what it's, what's being said, I think. I think it's just talking about the high calling. And there's lots of scriptures on it. One, I'll just mention Hebrews 10, 19, and 20. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter into the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, I think that's the key phrase. This is a, a something new, had not existed in the thousands of years prior to the high calling being open after our Lord's uh, crucifixion and his divine glory reward to immortality and the divine nature. It's a new and living way. And so even though the amount of faithfulness required, like comparing John the Baptist to somebody of the church, might be the same, the reward is different. And notice it does say the kingdom of heaven, not the kingdom of God. So it's more the aspect, I think, of the level of the reward not the degree of faithfulness. So maybe that's a way to look at that. Um, well, we have a map here, and I'm not real good with maps, but I just wanted to point out a couple of things to kind of get the setting of this. And I don't know if these dates are, how accurate they are. They're kind of commonly referred to, but uh, they may be off by a little bit, but I don't think that's important for the comments to come. So around 2 BC, John the Baptist was born and named. Zechariah prophesies, and John goes to the desert. We don't really know when he went to the desert in his life. I don't think he waited till he was 30 to do that. But anyway, that's a, another topic we, we really don't have a lot of scriptural um, details on. And then we go down to Jesus is born. Notice that's also 2 BC. Well, that's because they were born six months apart. So they were born, you could say, in the same year. And Jesus born, the word became flesh from the spiritual dimension to um, the earthly dimension, a perfect man so he could ransom Adam. And then going down to 12, what we would call AD, 12-year-old Jesus at the temple uh, questions teachers. We know that, and we'll comment on that later. And then um, in the spring of AD 29 or thereabouts, John the Baptist begins his ministry. So that just kind of gives us some timing. And by the way, just to get a feel for distances, you see on the right, the arrow Nazareth, that's where, you know, Jesus grew up. And then Jerusalem, capital and the center for the, you know, Passover, the festivals and so forth. The distance is um, about a um, hundred miles. I'm part of my screen is blocked here. Yeah, nine. What I have here, ninety miles. So that was a, a long, a long journey. Um, uh, that is considered to be, with normal walking, about forty hours of walking. And then maybe they broke it up into a few days. And I, we don't know the details of that. But it's a, it's a rigorous journey. And you think they were not. Uh, they didn't have horses, I don't think. So it was donkeys maybe carrying materials and um, uh, providing a conveyance for some that couldn't walk well. But it was a, it was a long, a long distance. And that's uh, uh, 40, 40 hours, uh, you know, eight hours a day, you know, that, that kind of a thing. So uh, just a little bit about the um, what was happening in that day in terms of distances. And the last one, the arrow at the right 
Um, it's hard to know this for sure, but it seems like the ministry of John the Baptist, the, the baptizing and our Lord coming to him and so forth and all that happened there, which we'll touch on today or tomorrow, was right about where that arrow is, just north of the Sea of Galilee, and that's the River Jordan. If you look down, you can see the name River Jordan. So just to get uh, the setting of it geographically, I think that that is about where he was. Okay, well, let's go on to um, uh, Mary and Elizabeth, just a little bit of a comparison between them, uh, just a few points. Uh, let's see here. Back. Okay, we know that the angel Gabriel, we'll have comments on Gabriel a little bit later, uh, appeared to Mary, but did not appear to Elizabeth. Elizabeth's understanding of what was happening did not come from an angelic proclamation, but it, it did to Mary. We might think that it had to be that way. What was going to happen to Mary had never happened in the history of the human race before her, and has never happened a single time after her. So it's understandable that there needed to be quite a manifestation of divinity for her to understand what was going on. Now, Joseph did not see an angel, did not see a, a manifestation. He had it, it was in a dream, but an angel did communicate with him. And we might say this really needed to happen because they were betrothed, I think, if that's the term, engaged. And since Mary let him know what had happened, and this was unheard of in human history, he really, uh, I, won't, I don't know if the word deserved, but really needed an explanation, especially in that culture. And so that was provided by a manifestation of an angel in, in a dream. Uh, we also know that an angel appeared to Zacharias, Elizabeth's husband, and that's an interesting story we'll try to touch on also, um, and about Zacharias and Elizabeth, a wonderful text. They were, got to move my PowerPoint thing to see this, they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. So they were a, a truly wonderful selection for carrying out this role. Okay, what's next? Uh, and then Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, not by an angelic appearance and proclamation, like Gabriel appeared to Mary, but by Mary's expression uh, to her of greeting, Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And you can you can read that in the uh, in the scriptural account. And an expression we're all familiar with, and that is that, you know, we know that Elizabeth was was expect pregnant with John, it says the babe leaped in her womb. Some co commentators, Bible commentators, feel that that might indicate the importation of the Holy Spirit upon John. So we have Elizabeth being filled with the Holy Spirit, and since John is a separate being, although in Elizabeth, but a separate being. He received the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> evidenced by the movement or the leaping in the womb. That's just a, a, a possibility, <laughs> we'll say. Okay. Uh, I think I have one more. Okay. Elizabeth, uh, uh, Elizabeth and Zechariah were, were, were old. Um, I guess what is considered old depends on how old you are. <laughs> by comparison, but they were well advanced. I think the King James says well stricken in years, and maybe stricken is a good word. Um, uh, by the way, the word Zech or the name Zechariah, just to point this out, whether it, and this may be a point of confusion, I don't know. There's Zechariah, there's Zachariah, there's Zacharias, but basically, back up here, they're all the same. So you don't have to try to figure that out. So they they were old. We don't know exactly how, how old they were. Um, um, and we don't know how old Mary was either. Um, just about everything I read about, about the story of Mary, just doing research, placed her 
Some said 14, but the most common age, which I think was a, a common age for this, not for the miracle, but for um, a young woman to enter into marriage, uh, it was not unusual for her to be about 15 or 16 years old. So that's probably how old Mary was. And the age of Joseph is not mentioned in the scriptures. Different commentators make guesses, uh, maybe 30 or something like that, but there's just no way of knowing. Okay, let's see. Let's get into a little bit of history about John the Baptist, just kind of a brief chronology of his life. We'll eventually get to, either today or tomorrow, a lot of questions that come about when this topic is discussed, like, did Jesus and John grow up together, and not next to each other as neighbors, but see each other? Did did John know that Jesus was the Messiah prior to the baptism? And there's just lots of questions like that. We've got a series of them that we'll eventually get to. But anyway, about the history of John the Baptist, um, <clears throat> an angel appeared before John's father, Zechariah, as we've read, advising that he and Elizabeth would have a son, so that we've established that. We know that Mary visited Elizabeth, and she was filled with the Spirit, maybe John too. John eventually left home to live in the desert. Um, I, we don't know when he left. I think there's, there's a pretty wide um, perspective, opinion, that he didn't wait till he was 30. He left er earlier in his life. And living in the desert meant a very rugged existence, none of the convenience of, conveniences of home, and even homes of that day, let alone today. And that does, a, does give us a insight into John's character, his uh, resplendent character of devotion. Okay, <clears throat> John preached a, a message, as we know, of repentance, and he began to baptize. Many joined John as his disciples. Now, even after Jesus appeared and was clearly the Messiah, John still had some disciples. You might think that all of them, since John preached about our Lord coming, when Jesus was on the scene and was baptized by John, that they would respectfully um, uh, leave John, and, because he was that was his message, that the Savior's coming, and they would get behind Jesus, so to speak. Um, not all of them did. Uh, that'll come up later. A lot of things coming up later. Jesus came to John to be baptized, and then there was, of course, divine proclamations. Uh, we know there was um, the uh, all the manifestations and and uh, sites that were were truly truly unique. Um, the uh, a proclamation of the heavenly Father and so forth, um, endorsing him, the dove and who saw that and so forth. I think I might get to in a minute, but we know that it, it happened because it was recorded. So that made it absolutely clear because John did see something and hear something that Jesus was the Messiah. That's who he was waiting for. And Jesus eventually made an appearance and was baptized. And, and it was confirmed by what happened in a supernatural way around John. Um, now, we know that John uh, criticized uh, Herod. Uh, about his marriage to Herodias. So that's something that we're, we're all familiar with. And he was imprisoned for it. Um, he was later executed by beheading. And there's a whole story behind this, but it was at the request of Herodias's daughter. We know, we know the story. We're all familiar with it. It's interesting, when the news spread about the death of the Baptist, when it came to Jesus, we read, when Jesus heard of it, he departed. He departed alone, alone, thence by ship unto a desert place. So I think we can make the assumption that while this was 
I don't think unexpected by Jesus, it took him aback a bit. Here was a man, John, that had spent his entire life devoted to Jesus, announcing the coming of the Messiah, a life totally consumed, a life of incredible sacrifice. And now he was not only imprisoned, but he was executed. He died. And I think Jesus wanted some time alone, which he probably didn't have a lot of, to just contemplate and appreciate the ministry of John the Baptist. And we see that in some of the words he spoke after John's death. Well, going on to just another segment of this, there in the Old Testament, there are prophecies of John the Baptist. And there are they're found in three places. One is, is in Isaiah chapter 40, verses three to five. And the other two are in Malachi, Malachi 3.1 and Malachi 4.5. So the Isaiah text, uh, part of it, we won't read them all. Uh, we don't, won't read all of all the text for each of them. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. That is repeated. All of these are repeated in the New Testament. Uh, who, who said them and so forth? You can do that in your own study. But one of the places it is uh, repeated in the New Testament is Matthew 3.3. 3. The voice of him that cries in the wilderness and his singular mission of just one thing, one thing only, preparing the way of the Lord for the Lord. Malachi 3.1, behold, I will send my messenger and he shall prepare the way before me. And that's in Matthew 11.10. And then one more, Malachi 4.5, similar. I Behold, I will send you. And th this is a little bit different. And notice I have here, this is the last book of the Bible, Malachi, of the Old Testament. Behold, I will send you Elijah. Now, Elijah comes into play in uh, the words of Jesus, um, referring to John. John was not Elijah, but there were some similarities we'll look at. I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. I just think it's interesting that not only is Malachi the last book of the Old Testament. This scripture, actually verses five and six of Malachi, are the last two verses of the Old Testament. And they are about John the Baptist, who Elijah prefigured. So I don't know if we can make a great deal of that, but I do think it's, uh, it's worth, worth mentioning at least. Okay, let's see. Look at the clock here, see how we're going. All right. Um, here's one of the questions that might come up. Did Jesus personally baptize anyone? We know that John baptized many, 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 many. Uh, did Jesus actually baptize anyone? I wasn't sure. Um, uh, it, 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 let's read this, this uh, scripture uh, from, from Matthew. Um, John would have prevented him saying, I need to baptize, be baptized by you, and you come to me now. Now, one of the things about this is that I think is is interesting is, and, and we'll look at this particularly, it indicates to us that, G that John knew who Jesus was when Jesus approached him in Jordan. Um, he, J John must have known who he was. He says, oh, oh no, I, I need to be baptized by you. <laughs> Let's do it the other way around. And hey, you're going to come to me? So um, that brings up the, the point of whether or not at Jordan, did John know who Jesus was? Well, um, we'll look later at one verse that, like this one that says that he clearly knew something about him. And there's another verse where he said about the Redeemer, and the and the bath, 
baptism scene, he said, I didn't know who he was. So we're going to have to look at those two and see if they harmonize. And of course they do. Well, uh, apparently, yes, apparently Jesus did baptize some anyway. And we can find that in John 3.22. After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized. I, I would assume as just an assumption <clears throat> excuse me that Jesus did not do a lot of baptizing but he but he did personally do some so just a point of interest as we go through this now we had mentioned um Elijah and um the similarities or the there's a comparison about similarities between the prophet Elijah and John so let's just look at a few, just on, in a very simple way, not the detail. Um, some of the similarities, um, I think I might have misspelled similarities. I think I did, uh, of Elijah and John. Okay, I just, just caught that. <laughs> um, they both pre preach repentance. So that was something that was uh, a similarity. Uh it's interesting, they both wore what you might call the garments of the prophets that lived in the desert, <laughs> you know, the kind of the bare bones, camel hair garment, I think it talks about a, a a leather belt, they were recognizable, I, from what I understand, the camel hair garment was not particularly comfortable. And it was just part of their their life of sacrifice. And they both preached against evil kings. And we know that that got John into, into some difficulty. Um, and they were both killed as a result of uh, evil queens. Uh, all of that has both has have stories that could take up a lot of time, but we'll just recognize it, recognize it now. So those are so both preach repentance. They kind of looked alike. They they lived the life uh, of of prophets living under harsh conditions. Both preached against evil kings, and both were killed as a result of their the faithfulness their faithfulness to their callings. And also, it was happening on the scene where the king, or in the case of John the Baptist, his wife's daughter just didn't want him around anymore. So he was executed. Um, okay, Matthew 11. Um, 13 to 4, 15. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And this is kind of the key link to Elijah or Elias. And if you will receive it, this is Elijah which was for to come. This is King James. He that hath ears to hear, um, let him hear. So it's interesting that Jesus said, if you will receive it, this is Elijah. Now, whether somebody re gets it, so to speak, or not, there was a comparison in, in a, and a connection between Elijah and John. But he's speaking now more about whether uh, looking back on the life of John and knowing about the life of Elijah, if you can receive it, there, there's a connection. If you will receive it, this is Elijah. So I think we can conclude just from this statement that there is a special blessing in discernment, in taking a story or comment you might say, to the next level. It's like when Jesus was going by the temple, he said, destroy this temple in three days and I will raise it up. Well, I guess that could literally be true, but there's something hidden in there, obviously in that case, where there's another truth, there's another point, but it's easy to just pass right over it. But we don't want to pass right over the inspired word. And it's interesting that Jesus doesn't say you got you got to get this point. <laughs> he 
He says, if you will receive it, talking about John the Baptist, this is Elijah. And um, it, it's just a, a really a wonderful concept. If you will receive it, this is Elijah. So a special blessing that is available to us when we um, pursue something and look at it in detail and see, oh, there's a connection there between Elijah and John. And John, uh, Elijah prefigured John, and it le one study leads into another, and we're enriched by it. But Jesus basically said, you, you, don't, you don't have to get this, but, but if you want to, it's there for, for your edification. And I'm, I'm, you know, putting words there that are, are uh, putting out words that are not in the actual verse, but it's something that is um, uh, nice to contemplate. Well, let's see, we'll go for seven or eight more minutes um, for two reasons, to stop in time and make sure I have enough material <laughs> for part two. Okay. Um, I found this question interesting uh, because I think we've all heard uh, or believe that Mary and Elizabeth were cousins. And therefore, Jesus and John were cousins, second cousins, third cousins, or something of that nature. And the scripture, which makes the point, is Luke 136, but you'll have to be in the King James Version to get this or to see it as, as it is here. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. And so we know that, that um, you know, Mary went to visit her. And that was a real, that was incredibly, incredibly long journey. I think I have a, another map coming up on that one. Um, well, here we have the word cousin. You won't find it anywhere else, by the way, uh, referring to Mary and Elizabeth being a cousins. It, it doesn't exist in any other text. So we really have to look at this carefully. So um, now when it says cousin, it could mean a uh, first cousin, it could mean second cousin, third, and so forth. But I don't know how far down the line you go. But anyway, a cousin relationship. Well, let's look at Strong's Concordance and the word for cousin. It is Strong's 4773. And I'm not sure how to pronounce it. S-Y-N-G-E-N-E-S. Interesting, it has the word genes in it. Uh, sin genes, maybe? I'm not sure. But what it means is not cousin. It means related, of the same kin, related by blood. So it could mean related, of course, by blood in any way at all. But it definitely does not mean cousin. It could include cousin. But I don't think anybody thinks that they were first cousins. So, and behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she is also conceived and so forth, who was called barren. Now, let's look at the diaglot. And you can look at really the Revised Standard, the NIV, other translations, and they're all going to be different than the King James. So King James, underlined there, you see cousin. And just I just chose the diaglot as, as one example. And lo... Elizabeth, the kinswoman of you, of thee, even she having conceived a son in old age of her, and this month six, this month six is to her the, of being called barren. Okay, of her that was called barren. Okay, so anyway, uh, you have cousin, it's really kinswoman. And most of the time, it is tr just throughout the scriptures of the New Testament, it's, it's translated as relative. It's just a, a blood relative. And so I think we can draw a few conclusions, and that is that there's no scriptural support for the belief that Mary and Elizabeth were cousins. Therefore, there's no scriptural support that Jesus and John were cousins. They all were, however, blood relatives. So if you were to go to a search engine on the computer, Google, Bing, something like that, and type in something like, were, uh, were Mary and Elizabeth cousins or 
were John and was, was the Baptist and Jesus, were they cousins? There'll be a, a, a lot of places you can go that says that they are, but then you'll eventually see different sources that say, no, it's, it's just, the word just does not support it. And it's only found in that, that one text that they were relatives. I, I don't think this is a huge point. I think it's interesting that they appear to be blood relatives and there's a whole genealogy thing we can go into now, which I, I won't do, but um, they were related uh, in, they were blood relatives and there's probably a significance to that, but it, I don't think it would be appropriate to call them cousins just based on you know, what we've seen there. Um, let's see, let me just do this one and then we'll uh, turn it back to brother Richard. Were Jesus and John friends as they grew up? So when they, you know, when Jesus came to Jordan to be baptized, we've already saw that it, it kind of looked like, seemed like John knew who he was. But it will, in part two tomorrow, Lord willing, we'll get to where there's a text that clearly indicates that he had no idea who he was. And those two actually, as we would expect, harmonize. But anyway, there's only two primary references to our child, our Lord's childhood. You know, we know about him from 30 on and when he began his ministry. But looking back at his childhood, there's very, very little information. Well, one is Luke 2, 21 to 40. This was after eight days under Jewish law, um, circumcision, purification ceremonies in Jerusalem. And we know that um, uh, uh, obviously Mary and Joseph took Jesus for that, uh, just according to the Mosaic law. And uh, it, uh, here's a text. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth, and the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was on him. So that's a, a, a wonderful source for that. And the other time, the only other time we have any record of what Jesus did during his childhood is in Luke 2, 41 to 52. And that's when he was 12 years old. <clears throat> he and his parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. And there's a, there's a whole story there where Mary and Joseph found him in the temple that he was lost and they couldn't find him. They were actually already on their way back home in a caravan and just realized that Jesus wasn't there. Their son wasn't there. So they, you know, scrambled back to Jerusalem as fast as they could. I think they took them two or three days to find him. And you know, this is, did you not know I would be in my father's house? However you look at that in terms of translation and um, th they were upset with them. And it says that he would uh, comment about him. He would be obedient to them and so forth. Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. So we have that. 